All right, uh, welcome. Um, on behalf of uh, uh, the university, uh, President Horvath, Vice President Kearns, uh, I'd like to welcome you to a, an ongoing uh, series called the Entrepreneurial Education Series. Um, just when I think we've got the most qualified, best presenter or instructor for these, we, we find somebody that, that's equal to the par. These, these events have uh, brought in new and different folks um, and have been, from what I understand, and have seen very, very high quality and great feedback. Um, Dale, who's with us today, Dale Canning, um, is somebody that our program manager, Monica Kemp, uh, met at a networking event. I'm not sure which one, but one of them. That's working after good. work. If you haven't right. been to one, it's, uh, it's a paid event, but uh, always pretty well attended. It's up in Buffalo. Up in Buffalo. Yeah. So, as most of you know, any organization, um, um, you know, great staff uh, is, is very critical. So, I'd like to thank Mom Kemp, who's our program manager, who does a terrific job in setting up these programs and, and lining them up. And also, Lori Baronski, who's an assistant here, who um, manages the money, among other things. So, um, so our guest speaker, Dale Canning, is a co-founder and CEO of Premier Technical Services, uh, specializes in technical communication, learning, and development. Uh, he's a, an experienced business plan writer and has developed venture presentations, uh, content for numerous startup businesses, so a lot of, a lot of pitches, I imagine, yep. all that. Teaches leadership, team building, mentoring, um, and startups. Um, whoops. Let me step back before. Uh, is there a slide in there for the upcoming events? Before I read it in the news here, I said, here's some of the upcoming events we have. If you're a veteran or you know veterans or if you're just interested in attending, on July 18th, we have a, a part of our Veterans Outreach Program, a Boost to Business Reboot by uh, USSBA. It's on July 18th. WMBE, which is uh, Women Minority Owned Business Enterprises, that workshop will be on August 1st. Great Lakes Offshore Grand Prix boat races, which is, we're not doing ourselves, but uh, as much as I try, the city's doing, and that's, that's uh, so we're helping support that, and that's to be a great event. So without further ado, Dale Cannon, thank, thank you very you. much. Free day. First, a few words to live by. If you're looking for money, ask for advice. If you're looking for advice, ask for money. Anybody hear that before? It's, uh, I picked that up from a friend of mine up in, up in Rochester who's a venture capitalist. And I think what we'll find here in my description of things, I'm coming from a particular venture community, Rochester, uh, that has its particular characteristics, uh, the, the, the people that you're going to encounter who are who are venture capitalists or you know, sources of state money or, or whatever the situation is. Um, my, my situation is going to be likely quite different from yours. The businesses that I started and, and that I participated in are likely going to be quite different from yours. However, this is a, this I think this describing value piece is, is something that's it's going to be meaningful to you from the perspective of uh, looking at the business plan, plan building process and making sure that you get it oriented correctly, uh, correctly so that you're telling the right story, so that you're going to grab people's attention. Uh, typically, when you're in a, in, a, in a presentation like that, you've got a very short period of time. I mean, we've got two hours here today. You don't, you're not going to have anywhere near that. Uh, uh, current, current statistics for attention span are actually declining. Right now, you've got between 8 and 30 seconds to make your case. <laughs> So that can be a little bit daunting. It's, uh, it's something that uh, you, you have to be prepared for, and you have to think about what you're going to be preparing and the story that you're going to tell so that you grab somebody's attention who may not know you from anybody. Okay? Let's do a little exercise. We'll start it off with, a, with an exercise. And what I don't know right now is are we, uh, I, I, I know there's at least two people here who are not entrepreneurs, but is everybody else? in the process of starting or something similar to that. Why don't you uh, give me about 30 seconds on what you're attempting to do. Uh, I'm attempting to learn more about starting a business, but not really sure. Okay. So do you have a business idea? I've had several throughout the years, but every time I go to look at further down the steps, I always can find roadblocks and why it wouldn't work, so I just stop. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of those kind of, what are Oh, uh, like looking at my laundromat and then realizing that 
you know, been researching doing a business plan and saying it's really for the demographics. There's already another one that you can realize is in town to compete with. And, um, if you're doing the due diligence, it, it probably wouldn't fly. So I keep going to that point of talking myself out of it because I don't think it's a good idea. You got the thought. You want to do well, it? I think it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. What's your what's your line of work now? Um, right now I'm moving. So um, I've done a lot of different things. Worked in the college, worked in bookstores. Um, my husband's in technology, so we've done some tech stuff. So kind of all over the board. Okay. How about yourself? Currently, I'm for almost 15 years now, director for Chicago Striders, a not for profit countywide. And I've always done property management on the side. So we're not for not for profit isn't quite that lucrative. And so um, my fiance has worked in the school system, he's going to be retiring, luckily, and trying to maybe minimize my weekly hours and pick up more on my own property management then. And with that, through parts of my job, and I've been contracted before too to do public speaking and workshops and presentations and things like that. So I'm, I'm looking at those two things. Okay, so you have you have one that you might do a property management thing, is it? I, and I've always done that, but, always done. yeah, as an independent contractor. Correct. Okay. okay, and that doesn't have a business around it. No. No, it's you as a sole proprietor. Correct. Okay. How about you folks back here? Um, well, one idea from my son is we're looking at a possible uh, food truck type thing that he could do, mm -hmm. and then I'm thinking of uh, more of an educational kind of a, a contract for teaching. Uh, Cardiopulmonary resuscitation CPR that you know to grow that community wide. Uh, if there's a huge need for it, and there are not enough instructors, there's not enough people to get that out. And people that really need to be paid for that service and can't just continue to volunteer. So. And you two are. Uh, uh, I'm Mom and son. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and so the food truck would be your. The food truck would be my idea, and uh, I just want to have fun with it. I don't. <laughs> well, you got to keep the wolves from the door. You gotta, yeah. it's, it's got to be fun, but it's got to pay you some money too, right? Yeah. How about you, sir? Uh, I'm just an intern here. You're an intern here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got any, got any uh, ideas uh, you, that you want to one day start? Um, I mean, that possibility that possibility is always around the corner, I guess. Uh huh. But um, I mean, we'll see what the future holds, I guess. Okay. All right. Great. How about you? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I was hoping to get in. <laughs> um, Everybody's getting it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, well, I unexpectedly continued my education for the master's and my PhD, so I'm working on my PhD right now, looking into uh, like economic issues for females. And I'm trying to put my um, business background with my bachelor's and my research for my master's into a small consulting firm. Not crunching numbers, but more like um, mission statements, mission statements, maybe helping with our game plans, um, kind of helping other people to do some true love. Hopefully, you can pay off the <laughs> So, uh, tell me again what the, what the consultant is. It, so it would be, I wouldn't be like the, not the number crunching aspect, it would be more like the creative aspect, like startups, uh, visions, mission statements, um, so four, marketing four, plans. four startups. And you would coach them. Right? Okay, gotcha. Is that in your background? Yes. Okay. Interesting. And I'm sorry, sir. You were you were. <coughs> Scott Miller with the Small Business Development Center. Okay. Yeah. You're at JC James Tuck Community College. Okay. Okay. So what's come to the class and get some? Yeah. Who are you? Who are your uh, Who are your constituents? Constituents? Yeah. Really, anyone in the community that we serve. <laughs> yeah, just maybe outreaching and getting some ideas and you know, yeah. just seeing what else is out there. Uh, I'm actually in the process of opening up a record store for Onya. A record store as in vinyl? As in vinyl. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. it's, it's actually, I mean, I've been doing a lot of research on it in the last 10 years, it's just gone up. But like, I think about 10 years ago, it was going up two, 300 mm percent, -hmm. and now it's kind of dwindled down to about 10, 20 percent a year at a time. Mm -hmm. But it's actually driven by a younger demographic, which is really why I decided to do it. And um, the fact is that I'm doing it like right in college town, in mm -hmm. Virginia, so 
it's a good mix too. And I'm I actually just signed the lease, so I'm hoping to open up in August sometime. Nice. Yeah, hopefully right when they come back. So what is it about vinyl that is now appealing to everybody that uh, everybody was leaving in droves? Well, it's great. Thirty years ago. Right. Right. Well, I mean, the whole reason was because record companies decided not to spend money on records anymore, and they were you could shake it, the thing just like you know it would shake back at you. Whereas if you picked up a record from the '60s or the '50s, those things were thick, and that's when the companies were actually investing money in it. But then they took the money away from it because they were already losing money by the late '70s, anyways. And they went to CD, which was a fraction of the cost to make, and people were buying in droves. So it was an easy decision for them, and that's why they went through the '90s and through the first half of the first decade of the 2000s, and then you started to see. About 2007, 2008, it started to like go up, majorly driven by like New York City, for the most part. And um, yeah, the great thing about it now is it's a mix of demographics, which is primarily what you want. It's old and young, and there's people in the middle who, when they were really young, they listened to vinyl, and by the time they got, you know, maybe in high school, it was CDs. So they still even had an attachment. So it all started with basically young people picking it back up again. And, you know, revitalizing it, and everybody else always remembered it before then. And you had to do technology now where you can get a turntable and you can uh, cut a DVD on it. Oh, yeah. Or I mean, a CD or a USB or... There's all kinds of things they've done now. It's just not like your regular, like, like those old, old, like, record players that were, like, just um, by themselves and they had maybe two speakers with them that people had in their homes in the 50s and stuff. It was basically furniture. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, it's um. It's so your your, your addressable market is going to be here in Fredonia or Fredonia, Delta. Okay. Yeah, and, and people coming from Pennsylvania, for that matter, in Ohio, because I'm actually from North Carolina, which is right between Niagara Falls and Buffalo, and I'm actually probably going to be moving down here in the next month. So um, it's one of those things that there's actually a lot of them up that way. Mm -hmm. There's probably like there's six of them or something like that. So where I was thinking that there's one in Niagara Falls, so. You, they get the people coming from Canada. And in my hometown, which is North Tonawanda, they do have multiple ones in Tonawanda. So they would get the first people coming from Buffalo. So I'm caught in a pickle there. So I at least thought, okay, if I come out here and I can actually, you know, get a good deal, which I did, you know, I can at least start up for the first year and kind of go from there. If I have to, you know, get a bigger place, then that's that's fine. That means it's been a success. We've always had the internet too. Right. And then this might not really need a lot of stuff. Right, in this day and age, it's so much easier because I've even talked to other record store owners and they said it's so much easier now because even if you had a really high mark item that you can sell in the store, you just eBay or something. And Google Maps helps immensely too because you know people wonder, you know, record stores in my area, you know, they could be sitting on a couch in Cataraugus County or something, and all of a sudden they have um, a reason to come over here mm -hmm. that they wouldn't have thought of before. So what are they like? What is the what's the what's the general perception of, of audio that's on vinyl to audio that's produced in other ways? Right. So analog is always try to get to the value proposition here. By the way. Oh so, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, there's a common misconception that digital music is actually better than analog, and anybody can tell you who's listened to a brand new record versus a brand new CD that the analog on the brand new record sounds better. The durability becomes the issue because it dusts up over time and people don't clean the record. You um, can get warped. So you have, to, you have to actually like maintain the durability of the record, you know? Things people didn't do 30 years ago, they didn't put powder and plastic sleeves so the creases would get like, all messed up and everything. So the records would just go bad, they would just fall out. And there goes the durability aspect of it. Where now it's like, oh, I broke a CD case, now my CD's going to crap. Yeah. So, but the thing is, now what they're doing is they're repressing all of these old vinyls from 50 years ago the Beatles, the Stones, anybody who you can think of, Miles Davis, whomever, whatever you're into. So it's, it's not just one genre here, it's a huge demographic that they're really trying to hit on all the pinpoints now. And the turntable they come out now are like freakishly expensive. Like the brand new ones, they go yeah. for a thousand bucks. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the the, the the price point, not only for the turntable, but also for anything that you're going to put on it. Right. You can check finger hut. I'm sorry. You can check finger hut. Oh, okay. I mean, that. there is a like anything. You know, you've got like your primo marketing, and then there seems to be like sub markets. Mm -hmm. So it is possible for different 
when college students start to pick up the whole turn table? Well, absolutely, and that's the other reason why a lot of college kids can't afford that high end turn tables. So I'm going to have you know older models, you know, some from the 70s and 80s that you know I I basically remodel myself and you know sell back for the market price, whatever I you know can get it back for. It. Because people sell stuff all the time. It's like oh, it's broken. Well, no, it's not. It's, it needs a new fuse or something. Or, you know, the turkey will leave you fell. So you actually have to reinvest a little bit of money in there. But the investment normally pays off because you can get them super cheap at like garage sales or antique malls or anything like that. You just have to keep an open mind. Great. How about you? Yeah, I've been playing with ideas for things for a long time, but it's always photography comes to me because I like to take pictures, but not people pictures and portraits, pictures of other things. So the gentleman that just came in, what we're doing is we're going around the room and uh, talking about value propositions. These guys are a team. Okay. Yeah. okay. Some are fellows here working on a business. Okay. Who's uh, who's gonna who's gonna describe it? Go ahead. Hi. So this is KM3 Studio. We are a video game development company and independent company. So what we do is we'll do in-house video game development from print gaming. We'll also do video game uh, products for other businesses that want marketing. For example, McDonald's recently made a game that showcases their healthy options on the game, the 3D platform, so we can do things like that. And finally, we're trying to get into augmented reality and virtual reality for businesses like architecture. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Check. Did you get that right? Yeah? Anybody in agreement on that? No. Yeah. Just checking, because that's one of the things that we're going to talk about today is, you know, you have, you have your value propositions, you have your elevator pitch, you have your business plan. Is everybody in the company on the same page on that? That's an important thing to to have that that wrap and to have that uh, be at the top of mind for anybody that's in a networking event or you're approaching somebody or somebody's approaching you. Everybody's got to have the same message. Uh, back in the corner, were you are you an entrepreneur or I'm just an intern here. For now. You're just an intern here. Any ideas? Um, just you know, I'm thinking about doing a fashion company that's based off on. Um, uh, originality. Uh -huh. uh, basically, it's trying to come up with a process in which um, the fashion designer can interpret personal questions, almost basically a therapy session on it with the customer. And Interesting. Put it on clothing. Web based, they would have interaction. Uh, I'm not sure yet exactly. I kind of, if I had enough money, I would try to open up a store front first, and then like have a factory in the back. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, that's all. Okay, great. So, um, what I'm hearing in, in, in most of these, uh, in most of the instances of uh, people starting businesses, you're, you're sort of grassroots, sort of shoestring. Maybe you've got something in your past that you've been doing, and you want to make that into something bigger or better or different or, or something like that. And I will say that that's a that's probably a better way to go than to go and ask somebody for money. Although asking for somebody money. But so for money is okay as well. Um, when I first started uh, in business, uh, actually I came out of the, the U.S. military. I was in the Navy for, for nine years, and I was uh, I was an instructor, uh, technical instructor. I taught a 16-week course in a, uh, an acoustic spectrum analyzer that we used to detect and classify submarines. So you know, technical, right? So uh, because I was in training and I was I was teaching this course, I would uh, and did I did I miss a an opportunity for another value proposition? Are you? I came in late, so I that's okay. Are you? Are, are you? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you here to learn? Try to be, I guess. If you want what's to. your What's your idea? I uh, I'm working on a number of things, but I'm um, hoping to launch a uh, a new venture in the waste energy business. Uh huh. And uh, what's what's the what's the waste product that you're using? Which is pretty diagnostic. So actually, right? true waste. So okay. municipal solid waste and or other waste streams. Uh, creating value from it. Is that something that you will approach the ag community down here, or is it? 
uh, there, there is there is value in the ag community right now. We're really um, uh, on a broader scale with uh, with true municipal solid waste from like municipality like the uh, uh, DSMY Department of Sanitation for New York, where uh, how to process the waste so it doesn't go to landfill. Uh, what are alternatives to landfill? What are uh, uh, you know the zero waste concept of uh, instead of going landfill, creating some value from the waste. So you're extracting methane? Is that the general idea? Or? Um, <clears throat> a little bit beyond that. I mean, if we were just doing digesting, like food digesters, something we would be extracting methane. I mean, obviously we can take methane, but um, uh, I developed so far three different paths uh, to creating more value out of the resources: higher end, higher level recycling, higher the technology of recycling, uh, but all the way down to being able to use every last piece and whatever is carbon would be gasified, and then that gasification. So uh, you're, you're obviously got a green angle there, right? Um, and carbon footprint angle, but is there a price point angle as well? Is are you uh, are you gonna you gonna you gonna beat fossil fuels uh, on price? Uh, well, so right now, if you're familiar with the waste industry, there's actually a, there's, on the front end you have a tipping fee, and so you have the actual issue. Fee, you know, you got to pay. The, the industry is controlled by uh, by landfills and by companies that own the landfills and by what the weight, what the tipping fee is at the landfill. Uh, so the ver first revenue stream is avoiding the landfill, uh, taking that, that tipping fee, uh, and then the backside uh, revenue is, is <coughs> the highest level of values that we can create out of the waste products. Uh, for example, um, three through sevens right now, uh, you know, we, everybody recycles plastic and you see recycled plastic bottles. The reality is that there's a lot of dynamics without getting into too many details of what's going on in the industry right now where that essentially is, is even getting landfilled, you know, and not the first thing to follow in. But uh, uh, so the reality of, of being able to actually use commercially available technologies to, to actually harness uh, some of those things and, and, um, and bring that to market, you know, uh, out of a very, uh, a very stodgy uh, controlled industry. Interesting, and that's something you want to regionally down here, or is there you? Uh, the hope would be right now. I actually are running a pilot plan in uh, in Brooklyn, New York, and we've um, and so we've done proof of concept on the on the uh, development and on the technology. I actually um, developed a new process called uh, thermal de what I'm calling thermal densification to uh, basically thermally densify the product so that um, once it's it's not garbage anymore. It's not uh, uh, hazardous material. Now it becomes a um, uh, it becomes a hydrophobic, where it can reabsorb moisture. It becomes pathogen free, where it, where it's it's not a threat to society. Um, we also drive uh, the, the process that I developed also drives. Um, we could say moisture free, but what I'm trying to do is move back from a low moisture content, you know, because of the balance between cost and, and value, and then uh, just as importantly, homogeneous. Uh, so you take something that um, you know as, as that's garbage that's you know that, that could just be pretty much about anything, and, and be able to um, one of the avenues is put it into that level of product, okay. and then uh, and then now you would be able to. Um, now that it's, uh, you know, delineation is not garbage, you'd be able to move it into other industries. And so the biggest thing that my vision is to, um, is to basically short circuit the industry as, it's, as it stands right now, which is, um, you know, where everything goes to transfer stations, everything goes to a specific process. Cut it off, uh, get to the root of it, make the transfer to this non-hazardous product and then that way we change the whole everything from trucking it to to the hazardousness of it to the odorousness of it to the you know the other uh, properties. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay so as I was saying when I first started in business I, I, I was coming out of the military um, I went into the training business uh, selling training programs on those 12 inch laser platters uh, not 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 uh, not vinyl, but uh, you know the big 12-inch platters that nobody sees anymore, um, because the law of diminishing astonishment set in on that technology. It was very expensive to uh, to put a training program on that. Uh, it was expensive to have a viewing station for that. 
that's all changed. Um, I did some freelance work for a while, writing, uh, writing training programs, writing technical documentation, and then I went to work uh, on a contract basis doing work for Xerox. And uh, in, in, uh, in training and development and in technical documentation in, in, in Rochester, you're going to work for Xerox or you're going to work for Kodak, uh, maybe b &L. But uh, those were the two big players when I was uh, first starting out. And, uh, and so I went through a, a temp agency and went to work uh, you know, doing 40, 50 hours plus uh, a week writing technical documentation and technical training for them. And then these, these two guys that I knew, we both, we all said, hey, let's start a business. We'll eliminate the middleman and, and we'll do our thing. Um, so we did. Uh, first year in business, we did $6,800 worth of business, um, which said to us that we shouldn't quit our day jobs. But we stuck with it. And uh, in that, that following year, we got our contracts through Xerox, and uh, and so we, we left the, the staffing agency that we were work, working for. So that was an easy transition for us. We, we never felt a bump. Uh, that second year in business, we did $173,000 worth of business. And then from there, four and a half, uh, uh, 400, $450,000, and then $1.2 million, and then you know, up, up, up from there to the point that we had about 40 people who were instructional designers, technical writers, programmers, folks like that, so all kinds of folks that uh, anybody that you would need to put together an e-learning program or technical documentation for, in many instances, it was you know, copiers and printers. From there, and, and what happened in the Rochester market was that, uh, as, as I think is probably pretty well known down here as, as well, Kodak hit the skids. Xerox didn't really hit the skids like Kodak did. But they, 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 they pulled back in the reins pretty hard. So we were about 40 people. And by that time, interestingly enough, I was buying out all of my partners. And so after the, the point that I had purchased uh, the stock from my, from my final partner, uh, Xerox started to pull way back. So I was, it was sort of like I was sticking, sticking my hand out to catch the falling knife. Um, didn't know <laughs> what was going to happen there. Lost some people, of course. Um, but I managed to settle out of about 20 people and continue on. Started a translation company, foreign language translation company, and uh, we ended up with about 65 part-time employers, employees there. Um, and I ran all of that for, for about eight years by myself. Um, obviously with staffers and, and, and direct employees and all of that. Um, and then I merged that company with a company that did regulatory compliance consulting in the pharmaceutical industry. And a lot of times in the pharmaceutical industry, the, the, problem with, uh, the problem with someone who is not compliant is that they haven't been trained right. So we had all kinds of opportunity there to, to sell our wares, e-learning mainly, but uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry still likes uh, stand-up instruction quite a bit. Did another merger with another company that was uh, in regulatory compliance consulting in, in pharma. We made a bigger organization. I sold my interest in all of that at the end of uh, 2015. And um, hung my shingle as a consultant in, uh, in 2016. So boom, 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 boom. Um, I've, I've done this quite a lot. And I've had to sort of chain hats uh, several times and, and learn new things. And, and, and some things are really quite daunting. Regulatory compliance in, in pharmaceutical is, you know, they don't want to talk to you unless you've got master science, MD, PhD, whatever it might be. Um, you won't get in the door unless you've got some more few days. So that was, uh, that was an interesting learning curve. They're all over the place. Um, throughout my time as a, as a businessman in Rochester, I spent quite a lot of time, um, well, actually, we'll, we'll get to, the, to, to the, the, the business plans that I've written, but. Uh, gentleman approached me one time and asked me to write his business plan. He said, do you ever write a business plan? I said, one, hours. He said, well, I need this business plan. I want you to write it for me and, and blah, blah, blah. So I wrote that for him. And his company was Pictometry International. Um, they do uh, aerial photography um, and, and digital aerial photography. And they take those images. And you can, instead of an orthogonal image where you're looking straight down, they were taking images on the oblique. And what that does is if a, if a building is over there, it shows as a building. And then their field study software, you can measure from the bottom of the to the top. You can draw a square over a, you know, a parking lot to tell how many acres it was. If you needed to resurface, you could tell where all the catch basins were. 
um, growth plan for him, he, uh, he raised $25 million to go back to business plan, some of the other media that I did for him. Um, and he sold, when they sold that company, this is extraordinary, uh, it was for more than $500 million. So there's opportunity out there, the right combination of, of people, message, process, what you're doing, it can be done. You're always selling. If you own a business, if you haven't owned a business yet, you're going to own a business, you're always selling. And part of this is not only that you, you have to keep the work coming in the door, uh, if you sell used cars or whatever it is you sell, um, you're always on. You always have to be ready to describe to someone what it is that you do. You have to do it quickly and it has to hit the, the value points that you are establishing. We took quite a lot of time talking about your two uh, ventures, but really um, the thing that we want to get to is a point where you can told me, tell me pretty much what you told me, but get it inside of a minute. Elevator pitch. An elevator pitch, yes, exactly. Because you're always selling. <clears throat> if you're a business owner, you're going to be in sales. The other thing that's true about it is everyone has to sell. Everybody in the organization. Everybody should have the same message. Everybody should know what you're doing out there. And for, for a group of you that is a, that is a team, do you have other team members as well? No, I hear it. Okay. So everybody's got to do it. You know, you get that, uh, but I'm not a sales guy. Well, if you're in business, you're a sales guy. Okay, business plan. Um, these are some likely categories of information. These are not meant to be uh, all inclusive or exclusive or anything to that extent. It's uh, business plan is is there for really, in, to my way of thinking, two two reasons. Um, what do you think the first reason is? First reason for a business plan. How about you? Any idea? To make money. Well, how are you going to make money with it? What are you going to do with it? Marketing. Okay. And then a self-assessment tool to keep you on track. Boom. That's a, that's a very important one right there. Self-assessment. From the perspective that putting together the business plan is going to force you to ask and answer a lot of questions about your business. If you establish a vision, the vision, where do we want to be in the future? Mission, how are we going to get there? Those are probably the two most important things from the perspective of value proposition and articulating value that you have in there, but they're slightly different. I mean, they exist in the plan, they'll exist in some of your other media, um, important stuff to have, but then again, you've got to do an honest market analysis. You've got to approach it from the perspective that you may feel really great about your idea. You know, you may think that vinyl is the best thing to, to come back ever, um, but there are, and you've already done some of the analysis, right? There's you know, Spotify. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I gotta be Spotify. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So market analysis, you need to you need to know who your customers are and how you can approach them. Strategy uh, is, is more operationally oriented. <clears throat> Whatever your products and services are. Competitive analysis, really important. Sales and marketing, how you're going to approach sales. What are you going to do there? How are you going to operate? What are you going to do in, uh, in your operations? Uh, your funding amount. This gets played around a little bit when you're in the venture community because what you're what you're going to do is you're going to say, you know, I, I need some money. I know I need some money. I want to present this to you know somebody who has money who, who wants to invest in me, whether it's state money, whoever it is. And you put a lot of time and, and effort into that, and you say, okay, here is the amount. And then somebody who looks at it and, and might know a little bit about your industry, maybe they don't at all. They'll look at it and say, you're asking for too much or you're asking for too little. Both are sort of the kiss of death. You have to kind of do the analysis and do the work that you need in order to make sure that you're, you know, you're right-sized from a, from a funding perspective. And then your pro forma financials, obviously those are, uh, you know, as we dream about our business, 
we look for little bits of evidence that are going to enable us to start to uh, hang some meat on the skeleton of, uh, of the business plan and, and, and you know, here is the money that we need, here's what we're going to use it for, and at the end of that we're going to have this much left over. Um, people who are looking to fund venture as, as angels, as, uh, uh, well, and, and, and even in the state money, the first thing that everybody's going to ask you is what, what's their exit? Have you guys had experience with that already? Have you pitched from people yet? Not for investors, no. So we will be doing crowdfunding in the future. Okay. Sure. Okay. Your audience. Now I know the gentleman has an ascot and he's looking at you disdainfully. Not necessarily that way. <laughs> but <laughs> The fact is, you know, and, 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 and in particular, if they're, if they're venture capitalists, if they're angels, they've probably been around the horn more than once. Uh, they're probably older than you, and their favorite reference might be generations prior to yours. Um, certainly in technology, that's something that, that exists all of the time. If they're an angel, they see a lot of pitches. Somebody's always tapping them on the shoulder, calling them up, asking them for money. Um, so your stuff has to be very compelling. Probably less technically savvy than you if you've got a tech company. They're probably not up to speed on that. They're going to be remarkably unsavvy, I think, in, in many instances. The orientation business could be just about anything. You know, retail, big business, uh, healthcare, like I said, cars and carnations. You shouldn't assume anything about that. You should, uh, you should make your, your messages very clear uh, just, to, just to get over that hump of, of frame of reference and what they know and what they perceive and what their preconceived notions are. They're not as crazy about your idea as you are. Rely on it. <laughs> it's, uh, I, and I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, to seem, I, I don't want to depress anybody, but it, it's really just to get to the point that you've got to make it exciting, you've got to make it interesting, um, you've got to you've got to articulate exactly who is going to benefit from it, um, and and again, you know, his exit is what he cares about the most, and he sure wishes that the process of assessing startups was a faster process, but it takes time, it takes effort, it takes effort on everybody's part. But whether they're private or public money, uh, you and they share a goal, and that's the success of your business because. They don't exit unless you do well. And like I said, the first thing that they're going to be interested in is their exit from your relationship and how you structure that. So you may or may not ever run into, for a lot of the businesses that we're talking about here, uh, you may or may not ever run into a person like this, but if you're going to ask a, an angel investor for, for, for money, this is probably what they're going to look like. Questions about that? Questions about anything so far? My buddy Al said, "If you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough." And I think that's true about his uh, his line of work. Probably the most complicated, complicated, mind-bending uh, concepts that, that are imagined, and he was able to articulate it simply. So. If it is a complicated process, you need to boil it down to the simplest elements that you can that you can articulate. It's critical. So, what are your value propositions? It gets down to this: your product or service makes whatever the situation is cheaper, shorter, less painful, more successful by whatever your description of the solution is. Okay, that's got to be something that, that is driven into your business plan. It's got to be something that's driven into your elevator speech um, to, to, to make sure that you are saying the thing that's going to interest someone and describe exactly what it is in the shortest time possible. If you have more than one value proposition, green and money saving, for example, that's great. And it's great to have as many as you want, although you know, up to a certain point you want to 
can sort of rein it in and start combining things perhaps. It's better in print than in a conversation. You want to keep you know, the conversations as impactful as you can and as quickly as you can. Whatever your better mousetrap is. Clearly they need a better mousetrap. <laughs> Okay, in your business plan, and in particular, in, in particular in mobile technology, the stories about the, uh, sorry, this is something that, uh, this was a late ad. So, take some notes. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. Um, this is the one that I was telling you about before. Uh, Eagle View purchased pictometry for, like I said, north of $500 million. Made a lot of people multi-millionaires. Uh, not me, though. I was paid help just writing the business plan. Um, for, for that solution, there was a lot of technology behind it. The stories we, we told were nothing really about the technology, more about how the technology was going to be used. Uh, that kind of aerial imaging and the software that went with it was being marketed to county government. And basically what they did was they would fly over the county, they probably done this county. They would fly over the county for $50,000 and they would charge the county the $50,000 for the flyover. And then everybody from county government down got the software for free. And in the county government, in local governments, then they, they were receiving the, the database of images and they were receiving the software for free to drive usage, get usage up. And so what we wrote about, and, and actually I spent a lot of time, I spent about two weeks traveling around with him doing presentations and, and, and seeing all of the, the ways that, that, that they were presenting this stuff. So I started the business plan with, here's what the technology looks like, boom, 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 boom. He looked at it, and the president of the company looked at it, and he says, this is not what I want. Like, what? He says, I want stories. I want, I want you to tell people, I want you to tell the, the investors how this is going to be used. Oh, 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 okay. So we told stories about first responders. With this kind of imagery, imagery in, this, in this software, you can get a 360 degree view around a school building, for example. So using that information, um, if you're a first responder to an active shooter situation, for example, you can see where all of the entrances and exits are. So we told a little vignette about that. If you're in uh, urban planning and, you know, uh, somebody's got to go out and count the catch basins on Central Avenue. No, you don't. You can do it right here. One, two, three, four, five. It's, uh, it's in this image. Um, Fire trucks. Where are all the uh, hydrants in a particular area? And with with the with this imagery, uh, we can tell you know how many hoses we need to lay out. That sort of thing. So so three different stories there that uh, that work pretty well to uh, obviously raise some money for them. <coughs> Effort Labs. I was actually a, an investor uh, and a principal in the company. I sold my interest in that when I sold my my other businesses. And. Uh, they did a, uh, an implantable chip, a little vessel that you can put engineered cells into, and those cells are, are engineered to fluoresce, to light up in the presence of certain biochemicals. Good technical stuff. It's used for chemotherapy dosing control. It's going to be used for chemo chemotherapy dosing control. And so, again, rather than telling that story about Know, the technology and what's in the whole thing and how we engineer these cells and you know whether it's technology that exists or it's new or has to be um, developed we were telling stories about people with cancer and how if you use this device the dosing rather than having a chemotherapy dose that on like this and then down like this because you have to recover because chemotherapy is poison basically they're poisoning the cancer and by the way you're getting poisoned yourself, so you can only take so much of it, and then you have to recover. When you recover, so is the cancer. So what the what the device did that we uh, developed was it, it tightened up that, that curve, so you could do shorter and lower doses of chemo 
to, uh, to help you to recover um, and not get sick. They ended up getting half a million dollars from the 43 North business contest up in, uh, business plan contest up in Buffalo. Uh, the proviso was that we had to, we were in Rochester and we had to open up an office in Buffalo. So we did that, they're still up there, still in development. I'm not really quite sure where they are now because I'm not part of the inner sanctum, but uh, still going. Aces Energy is one that I'm working on right now. It's not done yet, but it is one that is uh, an energy storage solution and it stores heat. So, so what? Um, the applications are mainly around uh, alternate, alternative energy forms, uh, solar, wind, that sort of thing. And the problem in that industry is intermittency. Um, when the sun goes in and the, and the wind stops blowing, you need to have some form of energy that's going to power the grid. And this is grid scale stuff. This is, you know, you would have this um, as part of the electrical system in the town of Dun Dunkirk. It's a 60 megawatt system. So uh, the, the, the stories, what the stories will be there will be about that. And they'll be about remote military installations and, and, and any place that you can think of, Puerto Rico for example, where they need alternative forms of energy because in Puerto Rico the, the grid got flattened of course. So you need, uh, you need some, some storage to, uh, to make sure that uh, you have you have lights when you want lights. So first, the story is about the problems that it fixes, then any of the stuff about how it works. And a lot of times uh, in, in a business plan, you'll have, obviously, as we discussed earlier, an executive summary, then you have all of the other stuff. Way down at the end, if you've got a really super technical and, and complex explanation that needs to go on, go to the appendix. Don't, don't make people read through that. They won't. And they won't, uh, and they won't fund you because you didn't spend the right amount of time talking about the right stuff. Questions so far? All right, describing your customer. So, in all of the instances that I just described, I had to say who my customer was, and I had to describe what their problem was. And you know, you may have somebody, my God, they can put the Library of Congress on my phone, but they can't make a widget to fill this simple need. He's a customer. That widget you make, that's the story you want to tell. You want a story about a specific need? You want to see how your product or service fits into that need and, and solves that problem? You want to quantify that. And you know all of the things that we like in a prospective customer. Member of a large addressable market. When I say a large addressable market, I mean all of the people out there that might possibly buy what you're selling. If you're going to work only in Dunkirk, then you know what the population of the town is. Um, there's probably some some work you can do uh, research-wise in in the local library or here at the college to understand what your addressable market is. It's an international sort of thing. If you're if you're going to do video games and and is, is gamification into it as well? Not understand that. No. Huh? No, not necessarily. Okay. I know what that is. But certainly, certainly, you hope to, to strike it big and to have have it be the next killer oh, game. Yeah. 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 Or a series of games. <laughs> it's going to be right. It will be. <laughs> <laughs> so they have to have a real and unanswered need. Opening a food truck, starting a food truck, everybody gets hungry. And there's sort of a wave of food trucks happening right now, right? You gotta have money to spend. Or we're not talking about the so so if you're thinking about demographics, you know, if you have a younger generation that, that might be your client, how are they getting their money? Are they getting the money from their parents? Do they have their own expended money? Um, has gaming moved far enough into 20 and 30 somethings, 40 somethings to support your business model? That sort of thing. The way we communicate it is by generating a compelling story about that need in the simplest way your product or service resolves it. 
in the business plan. Probably the piece that most anybody who is looking to fund your venture is going to be looking at is the executive summary. And they'll say, yeah, I'll get to the, the rest of it later. <laughs> and when you are making that executive summary, basically what you want to do is you want to write the whole plan, and then you want to hack and slash and cut it back and have that executive summary just have the, the, the bare bones of, of what you need to tell the story and establish uh, the, the content that you need in order to get funded. Because they're probably not going to read much more of it until it gets to a point where, oh, well, state money here, uh, you, you might find that they that they have some MBA students who will take your business plan and they're going to they're going to rock and roll on your numbers. Uh, they want to know. They want to know what their exit is. If it makes sense. So do the the entertainment stuff in the executive summary. Cite the detail in the appendices or later on in the, in the business plan. And this is true if you're going for you know, an SBA loan or, or whatever. The elevator speech. People will glaze over if you start spouting numbers. So for the elevator speech, have the numbers ready in case they ask. But let that conversation breathe a little bit. Tell them what you're trying to do without, uh, without driving them you know, right into the numbers first thing. Questions about this? Okay, products and services as stories. Like I said, you've got eight to 30 seconds. And, and this, I, I actually took this from, uh, I went up on YouTube and I looked for, for infomercials. And, uh, and I found one for Brightfeet. <laughs> so what they said, you know, they, they've got their little, uh, whatever, 20, 30 second uh, infomercial. The dark is dangerous. This is actually, it's hard to see, but that's actually somebody uh, doing something that we all may have done, tripping over toys and whatnot in the dark. And don't wait for family. Get bright feet. <laughs> so that flow of defining what the problem is. I mean, infomercials are there for a reason. We see a lot of them. People are buying a lot of television time to, to put infomercials on, up there. The reason that they're up there is they work. You get the message. Sorry? Unless you have cats. I can, I can see it being quite entertaining in those United States. They're on you. <laughs> they're on your feet, yeah. So, it's got to be relatable. Obviously, this is relatable. Got to build a scenario. Demonstrate the pain point. In that instance, it's quite literal pain. But also, you don't want to wake up your family. So then, show how you fix it. Little headlights on your slippers. And as I understand it from the YouTube infomercial, there's actually a weight sensor in there that tell when you got your slippers on. And obviously, some sort of battery that hopefully won't burst in flames when you. <laughs> <laughs> You got to quantify the benefits. I didn't do that in the pictures here, but that's the part that, that's going to hook people. You know, it's much more expensive doing it this way. It's much cheaper doing it that way. Um, it didn't exist as a product before. It's an untapped need. Now it does. We think that we can sell these many of them. Okay, the value of being realistic. selling and like I said if you're in business you're gonna sell you gotta sell that's what it's all about when you sell your whole rap should be focusing on the positive future state and driving it into your narrative in a business plan and elevator speech you've got a narrative you've got a story that you're telling 
So you need to focus on the positive future state and, uh, and, and, and make sure that that's in your narrative. There is a downside. There's always a downside. You gotta deal with that realistically. Because if you don't, the people who are looking to fund your venture will kind of say, hmm, I don't think they got that quite right. <laughs> I think, they're, I think they're sandbagging a little bit on the, on the downside of the risk. So you've got to acknowledge it. You've got to say it's out there. But you don't have to drill into it. The numbers should always be well thought out and most importantly, truthful. Don't, don't exaggerate that. It's. Uh, and, and, and in fact, maybe maybe on the on the upside, you should say, you know, the headwinds that we're going to experience are going to be a little stronger. So maybe predict that a little bit less flowery than, than you might. Sort of the opposite in your messaging is exaggerating. You know, building that that image of a too good to be true future state. Future state of your company. What uh, do you what do you hope where do you hope to be in two years revenue wise? In two years revenue wise, we want to be able to be making a billion dollars per year, since the cost of the servers are around five hundred thousand a year. Wow. It will it's scalable it depend on how many players come. Okay. So you you would have to set up a, a server farm here basically, or where you're going. No, no, no. We'll use cloud based services. Yeah. Like Amazon Web Services, yeah, yeah. 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 saves you a lot more money compared to making your own services. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's not a too good to be true future state, but if you were to say in two years I, you know, book the Nintendo, uh, then, you know, somebody's going to, that's not going to pass the sniff test, though, right? Overstating the forecast revenue and valuation. Uh, I think anybody that watches um, Shark Tank see this all the time, right? And there's a little bit of a, a quandary there because I think on, on Shark Tank and, and I think it's it's true for for anybody who's, who's listening to a pitch, uh, you do want to make it seem better than it might be. You do want to take it to a level that says, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be not only uh, starting a, a company and, and selling product and service, um, but I'm also gonna be making money." Um, and therefore, my valuation is we predict thus. And therefore, if you invest in me, I'm going to give you this much equity. They want to know how much equity they can have, obviously. And if your numbers don't support the uh, the equity uh, situation, they're going to slap you down just like they do on Shark Tank, right? Minimizing the risk. If you minimize the risk, again, it's going to be another one of those things where they're just not going to believe you. They're either going to question your your competence or your uh, uh, or, or your veracity of what you're saying. Yes. No, I. Oh. <laughs> Understanding the headwinds. Everybody's got headwinds. Those things that uh, that are going to uh, push back on you as you try to move forward. And you know, I don't know what yours are. Um, in the case of Temperate Labs, the uh, the implantable device, the headwinds were that we had science and technology that still had to occur that required some very highly compensated people to do it uh, in, in labs and clean rooms and you know, so there were people, facilities, all of that sort of stuff. Um, we also had, and, and this is sort of the kiss of death in, in Rochester venture scene, anything that you have that, that, that has FDA compliant requirement is going to be very difficult to get funded. Because people will just like, you know, what's the next one? I don't, I don't want to deal with the five years that it takes to ensure that they're compliant with the FDA. Um, 
whatever your situation may be, you've got to make sure that you state those headwinds, but again, um, focus on the positive future state and, and drive it in the narrative. What we found was that we could mitigate that a little bit by looking for other ways to get the first money. If you say to a venture capitalist that, that it's going to take five years for them to start to get any payout, um, then you know, you're probably going to arrive at um, but if you say to them, but like, here's an opportunity for earlier money that doesn't have anything to do with FDA compliance in our, in our particular instance, because what we could do was we could disrupt the animal preclinical market and, uh, and using animals for, uh, for doing preclinical research. Um, I think as everybody knows, uh, there are laboratory rats out there and guinea pigs and pigs and you know, all kinds of different animals that use for various different kinds of tests. Uh, in modern times, those animals are what we call transgenic. Uh, they are genetically modified to model human disease. And as a result, they are very expensive. So what we said is, okay, there's that, there's a market there. Um, there are, you know, half a dozen maybe big companies in the, in the country that supply those animals, millions and millions of animals, into preclinical research. And uh, each one of those animals that is transgenic, it might be a mouse or a rat or something like that, it's going to cost between $350 and $400 a piece. So if you've got you to run some research that you end up you know, going through dozens or hundreds of, of animals in order to prove out your concepts, then you've got you to big burden. With our implantable, what we were able to say was, OK, Here's what happens in preclinical research. They got the rats in the cage. They pull a rat out. They you know shoot something into them, whatever the whatever the, the new medicine is, and the, the rat is is pretty highly stressed, as you might imagine. Um, and then they they put it back in the cage and they they wait for a, a little while and they grab it again and they they pull some fluid out of it. And then they're going to analyze that fluid for whatever marker they're looking for. And what they find is when you're handling those animals, the fluids that you pull from them have all kinds of stress hormones in it and all kinds of stuff like that. So, so it puts noise into the data. So what you have to do is you have to kill a lot of animals in order to identify what's signal and what's noise. So that's where your cost you know, shoots through the roof. With our implantable, what we would be able to do is put that in the animal. You can inject whatever you want into the animal. Animal runs around the cage, calms down. There's a sensor now. Our our our, uh, our device had not only this fluorescent capability uh, in, the certain, in the in the presence of certain biochemicals, but it also had a pho photonics system in it that could translate and send that information out to somebody who's doing research. So you can you can implant in the animal, put it back in the cage, and the data that you get is clean. And it's real time. And you have to kill the animal. So money saving probably to about the, you know, it would it would disrupt the cost of, of animals to the tune of maybe 70 to 8 percent of the cost that uh, that labs are spending on their animals. And you're not killing as many. So that's how we sort of pivoted from okay, we know that we've got to put this in people ultimately. But here's first money that is a non-FDA compliant requirement that we can make, you know, it was a $300 million business or something like that to or, or, or business area that we're approaching. So if you if you have some headwinds that you, you know, maybe are insurmountable, like that FDA compliance thing, you need to find some other value proposition that allows you to get the money first. Kind of make sure that you scope the effort correctly. It's only 24 hours in the day. People need to take vacation. You can't you can't put uh, predictions in there that, that will you know, sort of violate that in a, on a long term basis. People get fatigued. And again, asking for a little too little money. We talked about that a little bit before. Um, it's almost as bad as, as asking for too much. Um, because it, it sort of says they don't really understand this process very well. They don't understand very well what they're doing. Yeah.
Well, for our industry, especially with indie or independent video game development, a lot of companies like us will do crowdfunding, so we'll use uh, our stakeholders as in the consumers. They will pre-fund the product before it's built so that it can be built. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to undercut just a little bit how much money you're going to get because if you go on a website like Kickstarter, if you don't reach the goal that you set by a dollar, you don't get anything. Right. So sometimes you have to slowly understand it and then fill out the, the gap with your own number. Yeah. And, and, uh, and this, this, of course, is, is oriented to the more traditional ways of doing that. I think uh, crowdfunding certainly has its place. Um, and incidentally, uh, there's another thing called ICOs that are, that are coming up as well. Uh, initial point offerings to fund businesses. Uh, Non-traditional, I will tell you right now, with the conservative nature of the, of the crowd in, in Rochester, uh, if you go in there and say we're going to fund this with Bitcoin, they'll, they'll kick you out. <laughs> that is not to say that it isn't happening. I was just talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago. He's got a software company up in Buffalo. And his plan, interestingly enough, uh, was to approach the gaming community. His idea is he's got a software uh, solution that, uh, that makes one big virtual machine out of the IoT. And uh, his proof of concept, uh, what he figured he would do, was go to the gaming community when, uh, I'm not sure what the gathering is, you have contests every now and then, where like, people will, will go and, and show up and yeah, really yeah. compete. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and in that collective audience, he was saying, hey, here's my cryptocurrency, here's my, my crypto coin, I will give you one if you let me borrow time on your PC. <laughs> yeah, nobody did it. He needs to go to GDC. He has to go to this conference. Okay, well, I'm sure he knows all about it. He's way into it. Okay. And he's, 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 uh, he's actually my generation, so it's interesting to, uh, to see him uh, in, that, in that community trying to make it work out. Okay, so that Sandbag, and I'll talk uh, a little bit more about this. I think we've, uh, we've already talked about it a little bit. Um, again, understating can cause people to question your motives or your confidence. Understating the revenue is less of a problem than, than the other ones. Um, but again, it's a question about your confidence and whether or not you understand what it is that you're getting yourself into and trying to get somebody else into. You've got to know that stuff. You gotta have some, some really well vetted and uh, well understood numbers. Uh, people will challenge it. People who have been in business and, and, and maybe have a little bit more insight as to the way it really works than, than you do because you're new, um, will certainly challenge you. The competition, you guys got a lot of competition. What is it that uh, will be special about your games? Have you, uh, one is affordability. Considering that our target audience is for teenagers to young adults, our money is very tight. So you do the premium model, the games are free, and you can pay into certain things that you want as one more thing to the game. Mm -hmm. Another thing is the new features of the games that you don't see in other games. You know, The maps are very dynamic <coughs> and fun to play because they're very diverse cast of characters, each with a lot of different personality traits and different abilities. So, and it's a team-based oriented game with esports in mind. So then there's a competitive aspect of that that other games just don't have right now. Mm -hmm. okay. The risks. What are the risks in the uh, in, the, in your energy companies? Compliance, uh, emissions, uh, you name it. Unfortunately, anytime you're dealing with highly regulated industry, you know, somebody could easily turn around and say that's not meeting the requirements of, of, of uh, what we expect. Mm -hmm. Are you coming from waste management uh, industry? Uh, actually, um, I'm not originally from the waste management industry, no, I'm actually from the, uh, the district energy, part of which energy storage and stuff is, is actually a very strong part of my background. Uh -huh. um, and what happened was uh, I had been developing renewable energy products or core concepts, doing things like um, uh, integrating uh, uh, 
digesters and methane producing type of things into mining power plants. And uh, as part of that, uh, I saw the vision of, of trying to um, go to this level with, with Garvey. But my one of my partners, or my partners in it, are waste management. And um, so my first investors are, are people that uh, are carvers. And, uh, and they've been struggling with the solution that as an engineer I put together these technologies and the concepts. And so they, um, they've been very, you know, that, that's, they helped me understand the industry or the dynamics of the industry to, uh, to um, see what can go wrong. But, yeah, I mean, and then there's, there's politics. I mean, there's, there's so many things that can be involved in, in managing waste, unfortunately. Yeah, so, so in your case, you were sort of uh, adjacent to the industry that you're entering, um, and you knew quite a lot about it, but you knew that you had to have some other people who knew it really well and good in order to be successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there was, there was uh, you know, the, the, in order to, you know, you, you don't really learn, and I'm a believer, you don't really learn anything until you do something, you do it. And you're heavily involved in. I mean, to, to hypothesize and think about something from afar is, is, is wonderful, and it's and it's and it's good mind exercises. But you never really learn anything until you do it. So, uh, actually, entrenching yourself in the industry. And I worked first started solving a problem for them on uh, food, on what food waste, mm -hmm. and uh, gained a lot of the confidence from that. And then I and then I started realizing the other opportunities beyond that uh, and, and developed, you know, trying to develop some solutions for them as well. Interesting. How about uh, your record business? What are your risks? Um, probably just the idea that people can just go on Amazon and get something perhaps a little cheaper, not necessarily faster, obviously, but, um, you know, if they have a Prime membership and they just, you know, mm -hmm. like just throw a lot on their bill and stuff, they could save some money in that regard. Amazon and Spotify are probably my biggest concerns in that regard. Just, yeah. the, just the overall internet. But at the same time, my biggest friend is eBay. So it's, you know, it's a balancing act kind of at the same time. Because like I said, I could have something that's worth two, three hundred dollars in my store. And there's no way I'm going to sell that to a college crowd. But right. shoot, if you're on eBay in California, you can buy that in a day or two. Right. So you will mitigate the, uh, the risk associated with that particular online market mm -hmm. by having bricks and mortar. But for the people who want that, but also by having an online presence. It's like when people do eBay stores. I don't get that. I don't get like eBay pickup stores because that's like, I mean, I don't know how you make money off of that, but it's kind of like, that, that's sort of where I'm going with it as far as like, <coughs> most of my inventory will obviously be there as opposed to what they do there. I don't know their inventory is there. But, um, you know, at the same time, like, you have competition on the internet, you kind of have to embrace it at the same time because you don't bring left behind. Yeah, yeah, you you got to deal with that uh, that marketplace. Mm -hmm. How about you? Me? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, well, everything is kind of secondary right now to my working on my degree. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, what I'm trying to do is maybe set foundations in a place that, as I'm getting closer to my dissertation date and, and hopefully achieving my PhD, mm -hmm. that I will have some um, core client power. Or networking um, at this place intersecting at that point. So what's your PhD in there? Um, well, it's business administration organization leadership. Mm -hmm. I am researching um, female economic abuse. Female economic abuse? Right. It is like a um, part of the domestic violence domestic abuse situation. Uh -huh. It, it, it sounds like a uh, it sounds like an untapped market to me. Who else is who else is in the space? Who who, who is doing what you want to do? Um, probably anybody who's going to bachelor's degree to some degree. But I don't want to fo I want to focus more on a small, more niche market of doing things like maybe writing, communication, so grant writing, um, vision company. Kind of the things that maybe people creatively might not really 
seeing the marketing plan wasted to maybe go about developing a marketing plan that isn't so expensive. Um, who do you think the addressable market is for that? How many how many people in, in your in your area? area? Well, there will be a wide variety of services, so there's potentially different audiences. Like I did some editing for a professor, mm -hmm. um, so that's along the lines of the editing for the reading. Um, as far as businesses, there's a lot of people that want to start businesses, but maybe not know how or um, have the confidence to do it. So it's kind of maybe more facial aspect to it. I haven't really covered that. I'm, I'm looking at basically at this point. Mm -hmm. Like I say, there's weekly research papers in there. Yeah. Yeah. The good thing about that kind of content, you know, vision statements, mission statements, um, and to a large extent, leadership and team building, which I do as well, um, is that there's all kinds of content out there. So if your uh, if your background doesn't necessarily support, you know, I mean, I, I do I do uh, the work that I do in leadership and team building. I'm working with a guy who's a former two-star general in the army. So he's had 33 years in the army. Uh, he was on Colin Powell's staff. You know, his his bona fides are, are right there. Everybody, you know, you you look at the guy. Uh, you look at his resume, you say, yep, yeah, this is the guy that we want. Um, not necessarily for a militarily oriented leadership and team building thing, because it's quite different from that, really. He's much, much more about uh, servant leadership. Um, but, you know, so we've got that. He's got all of his own shtick and the things that he does. Um, but, um, you know, you can, you can look out there and you can find Drucker and Maxwell and, and uh, uh, Collins and, and all of these other guys and gals who have put books out that that tell you, you know, how to do it. Um, so so there's plenty of media out there for you to, to come up uh, the curve uh, and put together your own stuff, obviously, you know, adhering to the I, appropriate copyright. I think at this point, too, it's um, I have one teenager who's left, yeah, the last one more year. I've got a lot of things kind of going uh, on, and I'm trying to see what will gel. Know, what the how the puzzle pieces will shake out and, and fit together. So I'm not too worried about that. It's maybe um, I think a lot of networking right now. Yeah. Do you have to do? Will you do this to keep the wolves from the door? Or I will have to keep the wolves from the door. Like yeah. The school loans are going to be. Yeah. Be so so a big risk is going to be sales and marketing. I will tell you, with, even with a guy like that, with his bona fides and, and mine and reputation in the local market there uh, in Rochester, it takes a long time for us to get that next customer. Um, you really, and, and it doesn't have anything to do with our value proposition, really. It has to do with, does the customer want to spend that money on that picture of the customer? Or does the customer see the need that you see that they have? Yes, yes. And, and maybe they don't, and maybe that takes a little free work. Uh, you know, to get in and, and, and give them a little value by saying, hey, I want to do a little evaluation for you and uh, tell you where I think you are. And usually for free, they'll say, yeah, knock yourself out. <laughs> yeah. How about you? It's a small area, so there are some people um, who have some small business property management services. Mm -hmm. When we say business property management, what do you what do you mean? Um, working with individuals who own their own homes but rent to people, mm -hmm. and then also larger apartment uh, complex developments um, who might need somebody per diem to just come in and renew leases or come in and do inspections and mm -hmm. things like that. Cleaning as well, or just mm -hmm. the, just no. the um, arranging for contractors uh, for services provided. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then trying to get the owner the best price within the area. Mm -hmm. uh, so so competing against people who are already doing that mm -hmm. um, and who've been in business obviously a lot longer even if it's a side business. Uh, some things in my favor though, I, I really have a personal approach with tenants and in the last 20 years I've only had to process three evictions. Mm -hmm. So being able to market that that this is this is the bang for your buck. And I've also processed the evictions too, where they didn't, the um, owner of landlord development 
property owner did not have to contract with a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, which saves a tremendous amount of money. You just show up with cops. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I ball locked, I've Bad only had to ball lock three doors. <laughs> Well, good luck with that. I, I own a rental property, but it's a vacation rental in the Adirondacks. Oh, very nice. And so uh, up there, uh, because of the sort of the, you know, everybody's in the hospitality business or sure. right there, um, you know, there's there's a lot of demand for, for that, kind of, that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, in particular, because people often have places that they are completely absentee until, you know, they might be up there as we are, you know, probably four or five weeks throughout the year at most. Um, but otherwise, we, we don't know what's going on on that property. It's basically how it started over 20 years ago was with my uncle who owned a logistics company was on the road all the time mm -hmm. and started just buying up properties here and there and he wasn't in town to take care of them that much. So, Do you see a, a benefit in it being a college town, the sort of the transient nature of the uh, people that, that live here? Mm, yes and no. Um, I, I try to make a point not to work with landlords that are not from the area because I find they don't have as big of an investment mm -hmm. in the community and they don't really care if the yards start to look insane or if the cops are being called to the properties all the time. Um, so I don't, I don't do a lot of work with, with um, folks who own college rentals. Mm -hmm. I, I have in the past. I don't believe Not so much anymore. <laughs> I, I had one son go to Potsdam and one went to Geneseo. And uh, the place that, uh, that, that my one son lived in, in Geneseo was just, uh, it was witheringly bad. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> and the guy didn't want to put a lot of money into it because he knew of it was going to get wrecked. Um, so it's a, it's a I did have a responsible um, owner who I had to go to small claims court to try and, because the security deposit wouldn't even touch the amount of damages that were done and that's when I started doing more inspections on a regular basis um, but the court completely ru ruled in the students favor and then I had to go to their own hometown <laughs> for the small claims court and that can process it here in Cardona. So yeah yeah so to, to mitigate the risk of you know college students you're going to be a tier up. Um, exactly. From, from exactly. It's, it's a little bit bigger of a headache. Yeah. Not all the time though. Yeah. How about the food truck business? Well, we actually kind of um, researched some areas. One, I think, uh, is it sustainable? What's the location of it going to be? Again, looking at your demographic. Uh, there's an area over at Mango where the, uh, the courts, the family courts, there's no place to immediately eat. Courts get held over. There's no place for these people to go to anything. The town of Chautauqua will allow a food truck to be there. Um, and so those certain days, you wouldn't have to be there every day. You're looking for something that uh, he could do to pay, would make uh, money for himself, and that kind of thing, uh, to market a product that is very, very good. But because you're not there every day, you're not over feeding the population, mm -hmm. they're going to look for those days you're open. You're open, say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You know you've got a committed group to come Monday, Wednesday, Friday because it's not available every day. Mm -hmm. um, so would you do like a food truck in Buffalo? Um, because they do like food truck Tuesdays at Larkin yeah. Square and everything. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Yeah. 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 It's huge. You yeah. get so many young professionals. They started right. doing them around here. You should probably talk to Sue Mack. They have Siri Thai yeah. food truck. Um, she helped her students help them, and she's doing very well. She was at the Great Lakes Experience Festival. I, I think Fredonia also at their last yeah, they did meeting were discussing food trucks mm -hmm. and, yeah. and how the this college is allowing them on campus more because they have an agreement with FSA. It was Buff State, I went to Buff State, and they always had Lloyd's on campus. Oh, yeah. And that's how Lloyd's got huge. They have a store on Hurdle now in Buffalo, and they've just grown exponentially because they had that campus uh, spotlight on them, and everybody went there during lunch hour. So campuses are like a gold mine for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, what's the what's the population of like Dunkirk, Fredonia? It's like 13,000 of Dunkirk, right? Just Dunkirk? Yeah. Just, just yeah. Dunkirk's like, like 13,000. 25,000. Uh, economic stress too. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and you, you, you have the um, uh, climate change, obviously, for winter. You know, you, if you have that in the winter, you just look at it doing it in the summer, and then you do something over the winter time, or do you have it sustainable enough for the just picking up and taking it and eating someplace else? Yeah. Because uh, mm -hmm. we only have. Do you think, like, I'm a snowmobiler, like, that would be cool if you can go have a food truck out here uh, by with some malt cider? <laughs> Um, the, the education one that I'm looking into, 
is by mandate and by certification requirements, all your nurses, all your physicians, all your youth rec programs all have to have CPR and many of them first aid. Uh, so that's very sustainable as many of those certifications are only good for two years. You're doing a certain group one year. Um, I, I probably have a waiting list now of people that want the service. Um, but I need to, as I look to retire, is this something that I could actually be a profitable business um, to just, you know, kind of fill that little gap between your know, social security. How much <laughs> social security? Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Do you, do you, do you have a, a particular idea in mind of what the what the rate would be for a session, or have you taken that um, far yet? Right now, actually, um, for um, it's the average around here that we've been teaching for is $35 an hour. Your Red Cross and your uh, All-Star ambulances are charging anywhere from $65 to $110 uh, per person. Per person, right. For the class. Mm -hmm. So we're just charging like $35 an hour. And a lot of times my, that just goes into pay for some of the equipment. But mm -hmm. it, it can be very profitable, but I just really, for me, I'm not really worried about a big, huge profit. Just, again, training more people that could be instructors and getting the information out. Right. That's and, what's and, going to and, and caring for your own personal financial situation. I mean, yeah, that's a so risk too. To yes. to say, you know, uh, hey, this thing could all go south, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I could be uh, I could be unemployed and, and without any prospects. And with the technology as it is, so many people now could take the online portion, and then do you have brick and mortar, or then they have to come to the physical skill set in front of me that I have to certify, or do is it more uh, amenable? and more profitable to actually go to their place where, okay, we've taken our online, here's our group of 10, um, can we do our skills here at our office so now they don't have people traveling all over and not being five or six employees. We're, you know, when you're doing those kinds of things and, and selling that, that's something, a huge benefit for them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so do you have like a regional medical center here or something like that or is it a fairly large or fairly small um, hospital? We have two hospitals that are considered um, training centers for the American Heart Association. You can also, uh, many, like if I'm a nurse, I can be certified by American Heart or I can be certified by the National Safety Council. Um, so you can go either way. But because the two hospitals are considered your AHA as the center, uh, they won't let other little, the AHA won't let a little individual start up unless I'm doing 1,500 people a year. Uh, they won't consider you a center. The hospitals are so short staffed that they're barely able to just do their own nursing staff, mm -hmm. and they're not really by charter. What they're supposed to be doing is getting out and doing more community wide training. So I have people coming to me because I'm an instructor under the hospital, mm -hmm. um, but I'm free to, to charge what I need to charge or not charge. I mean, I do a lot of it for free. Somebody's got a critical ill infant, I go to their house and I just teach them for free. I mean, it's just that's part of my. My makeup. Mm -hmm. um, the 30-year volunteer fireman, and uh, still volunteer. So, thank you for your service. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, I think in healthcare, the thing that is uh, perhaps risky for other people who maybe aren't coming from inside of it, uh, you know, approaching healthcare in general is is, mm -hmm. is is a lot more bureaucratic than I think people realize, and difficult mm -hmm. to get your contracts through. And and I think they think because doctors make a lot of money and nurses do okay. That, um, that there's a lot of money being thrown around the hospital that's not. Most of them are, are really just pinching a penny until it screams. Um, so that's uh, that's certainly a, certainly a headwind there, but because you are coming from inside of it, you mitigate the risk right. by knowing which levers to pull and which knobs to turn, mm -hmm. right? Great. You're also notoriously late payers. Yes. Notoriously. I, mean, I went from, you know, you would talk 30 days. They have now the standard for large-scale medical centers is 90 days. What was net 30 is literally net 90. Yeah. And net 90 becomes net 1. Yeah, in the, in the Where it used to be net yeah. 30 became 60. Right. Now it's net 1, eight, and then you have to price that into your into your uh, work. It's a good, it's a good uh, point. It's a really good point, and, uh, and I have some experience with that myself. Um, when I was first in business in a company called Premier Technical Services, um, we had a friend in the company who, when we when we invoiced in ten days, we had cash, and uh, that was our salad days, man. I mean, you know, if you put in an invoice and you get you get cash in ten days, 
Hallelujah, man. <laughs> Uh, you can you can run the business like it should be run, and uh, assuming that, that that cash is enough to uh, to establish a fairly fat profit um, margin. As time went by, uh, that changed. So then we went to 30 days. Then we went to 45. Then we went to 60. And uh, and, and and as you said, you know when when you're on a uh, you know when it says in the term sheet 60 days you're going to get paid 72 or 80 or something like that. Um, Merck Pharmaceuticals, uh, they gave us a term sheet that said 90 days. I was like, a quarter, a whole quarter of a year, we're sitting on uh, the, our, our, you know, we've already paid out. We've, we've, we've got consultants that are going into these places that make 150 to $300 an hour. And if they're working for, you know, 40 hours a week for, for a month, uh, you end up with some heavenly bills to pay. And uh, so then you have to look at it in terms of one of the things that maybe you have to deal with in your, in your business plan. If you're dealing with corporate clients, you have to deal with that. You have to deal with cash flow. You have to understand what, uh, what, what, uh, what sort of cash flow risks you have and how you can mitigate that. In our case, it was a credit line um, that we had to uh, secure with our receivables, and if you have, uh, and if everybody knows what a receivable is, when you when you perform a service and you send a bill, that's when that money becomes receivable, right? Um, and if you if you do a lot of that, you end up with a pretty good stack of, of receivables. <coughs> so we had uh, you know a million dollar credit line, and we were bumping up the edge, the, bumping up to the end of it um, because. We were getting stretched by, by these big companies that we were providing good service and putting people in there and they were doing what they were supposed to do. Um, and we were you know, sending the invoices on time. We had all of our, 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 our systems internally for billing and, and receiving were all in place. And we had people on the phone saying, hey, you know, it's been 120 days, where's the check? We had that happen all the time. Uh, but still, you know, their, their attitude in corporate America is, if you want to do the business with us, these are our terms. If you don't want to do the business, we'll find somebody else to do it. So that's a risk. Cash flow can be a big risk. It can start you. It can kill you. Cash is king. So risks. We talked quite a bit about that. Uh, investment amount, we already talked about. The work and the time. In particular, if you have some sort of a period of time where you have head down working on a solution it's not ready yet it's not ready yet it's not ready yet oh it's programming uh, we said it was going to be ready in two months it's actually going to be six months <laughs> oh uh, my lead programmer um, he's becoming a father so he is uh, now unavailable for you know 20 of the hours of, of, of work a week that he was going to uh, to use and uh, oh by the way uh, you know if it, if it extends out that far in time then it's going to extend out that far in money um, so again the work the time the money associated with that and you'll make more points for dreaming up well not dreaming up but for exposing all of the headwinds that you can logically think of you'll make more points for that than, than, than leaving them silent if you say to somebody Hey, this is a risky venture. I know. Uh, here's what we know about it. Boom, 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 boom. Um, then you'll you'll probably make more points with the venture community than you will with anybody else. Don't hold things back. Don't be untruthful because it will it will come out at some point in time, and then you're going to have egg on your face. And it's going to be uh, a much bigger deal. I have a question. The highlight there of the time involved. I know when you're first starting out, you're going to be putting in a lot more time than you're getting cash back for, what, it, what is the amount of time um, when you should start, you know, if you're looking at yourself as an independent business owner, you know, per hour I should be making this, and if I'm putting 70 hours a week in and I'm only, you know, netting a couple hundred dollars, when is it time to readjust things? Well, um, you know, and, and, and what you're talking about is a situation where you're not going to anybody to ask for money, you're just starting a business and, right. and bootstrapping it yourself. So really, those are you know personal questions about your your own finances and how far you can you can you can go, um, and you know whether you 
love what you're doing more than you love the money that you get <laughs> for what you're doing. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you look at my consulting business in in, in, uh, in learning and development, uh, there's a geographic uh, thing to it as well. In Philadelphia, where I work sometimes, or in Baltimore, uh, I can command $120 an hour. Uh, in Rochester, I might be able to get away with 65 or 70. Um, so. So you need to make those value judgments. Uh, and, but the good thing is, if it's just you, and you don't have an employee to, 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 to keep fed as well, then it's a lot easier for you to uh, it's a lot easier for you to manage. Um, that's one of the that's one of the things that I like about being an independent consultant is I don't have a team of 40 people that are trying to send their kids to college anymore. <laughs> And sales, sales is a it's a tough nut. You gotta you gotta work it all the time. And if you're an independent, if you're an individual, the time that you're not doing the thing that you're doing to get paid to do, you gotta be out there selling uh, that service. To so, so in, in in instances where it's going to be more of a corporation, a corporate structure, obviously you gotta have your sales structure down. You gotta you gotta have that ironed out. Uh, your your marketing plan, your marketing strategies, uh, you gotta have that ironed out. Not just for asking for money, but also because it forces you to answer the question and have a good plan. Version control. Okay, so again, talking about a talking about a business plan, and you're talking about a situation where you have uh, the potential of having multiple people uh, putting that plan out there to people, to other people, interested parties. You can change the plan. Everybody understand the term pivot? What that means? In the venture community, it's, uh, it's that change that you make. You, you have gone down a particular path, and you've done the work, and you've gotten the results, and you find that it's not the way that you should go. You find something out that makes the plan a little better if you just pivot a little bit, change direction. Are you guys in Agile? No support. It's not done wrong. That's wrong. So what's the what's the what's the basic idea there? What's the what's the idea about about agile that you like? Well, I like that you have so it organizes the idea so that you can work in little time intervals like week sprints or two week sprints, and then everyone's always updated on the progress. You see what's wrong quickly. Yes. You don't commit too much time to something before you realize it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an iterative process. You know? Everybody, everybody understand that? How that how that works? In Scrum and in, in Agile uh, development process, what you're doing is you're taking you're taking that thing that you want to do, and in their case, it's it's making a game, right, or a series of games, and you are you're 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 you're, you're deconstructing it down to its smallest components, and you are working fast and hard on those individual components, and you're getting feedback really quickly. So I think. And, and I, I'm talking to my partner up in, up in Rochester about applying this to leadership and team building. You know, where feedback, in, in, in leadership and team building, feedback is a very important element. It's all about accountability and, and that sort of thing. So, so if we have this situation where we can get feedback more quickly, bad news is actually good from the perspective of, you know, you're going to get bad news, it's going to happen. You're going to get feedback that is not so positive. Well, what's going to allow you to do is to turn in a direction that is more positive. And that's what Agile does. Yes. Giving feedback in itself is a skill that needs more training. We need more training. Sure. On how to give constructive, productive feedback. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've had some professors that are really great at giving feedback, and then others that just they don't give any at all. Right. Right. It's a uh, yes. It is a skill. There's a social skill associated with it. Um, if you're abrupt, dismissive, uh, you know, personally. Make it, making it a personal attack. Um, there's uh, there's all kinds of ways to do it wrong. There's uh, there's quite a few ways to do it right too. Um, Non-personal about the, the objectives and about the mission and about the intent of the organization. If you keep it about that, then you're less likely to have a situation where it's uh, where it's going to be taken poorly. And it has value. Okay, so. If you have a business plan, the important thing is to not have a zillion different 
versions of it out there. You want to have as few versions of it as you possibly can. You want to have, if you can, one source of all the content, not only for the business plan, but also for any elevator pitches or anything like that. If it's not in the business plan, it shouldn't be in your elevator pitch, and vice versa. Okay, so a single source, condensed down from the business plan to the elevator speech and whatever other media you have, if you have other media, it should all be pointed towards the value propositions that you're creating and talking about and making people aware of so that they will either give you money or buy your stuff. <clears throat> And this is, this is not as true as it was before because we can just distribute things with a click of a, a mouse, but you should give it away with a little forethought from the perspective of, you know, if you know you got an early draft of something and you blow it all out there so it's in the hands of a thousand people, then it's a problem for you if it changes. So give it away with some forethought. Make sure that you're, you're, you're sure that you want to send it out. Make sure it's got the messages in it that you want to have. And, uh, and that way you won't have to you know, jump through hoops to, to, to get the right information out there. I work in documentation and training, so I know this really well and I know how to do it really well. You want to have one person control it. You want to have that person be a very stingy and uh, critical gatekeeper. Make sure that they, uh, make sure that if, 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 if somebody asks you for something, that you're talking to the gatekeeper to get the, the latest, the greatest, the one that has the stuff in it that you want. And if you do get it, don't throw that one away, don't overwrite it, don't, uh, don't, don't treat it as if it has no value. The one that you started with probably has some gut reactions to things that are going to be uh, more valuable to you later on. So archive it, save it, get it off your PC, put it on a disk, lose it with the rest of your stuff. <laughs> Okay, your elevator pitch. Now, nobody here was making bacon flavored snack cakes, but uh, if they were, I'd be an investor. What you're trying to get to with the elevator pitch is not a sale. You're trying to get to the next conversation. You're trying to give them as much information as you can to hook them to ask for more information so that when the elevator goes ding, you can both walk off and feel like you got something out of it. In this instance, you know, she gave a good elevator pitch. So right outside the elevator, he was like, tell me more. It doesn't necessarily ever happen that way. Usually it's exchanging business cards or LinkedIn profiles or whatever, and uh, moving on. And of course there are no rules. Some elevator rides are shorter or longer than others, and I suspect in this neighborhood that they're all pretty short. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't you talking on the stairs? <laughs> well, wherever you're doing it, uh, they're giving you more time than they'll actually listen. Uh, like I said, the attention span numbers uh, now just, just reduced from, I think, 2007, it was 13 seconds, now it's eight. So, yeah. That's not particularly realistic, of course, if they're an interested enough party to, to ask you about that in the first place, then clearly you got more than eight seconds, but if you go more than a minute, most people are going to start to turn off. You know, they'll, they'll be on to something else, or you'll, you'll, you'll say something that, that piques their interest, and they'll shoot off on that, and they won't hear the other stuff. So, so get, it, uh, get it over with as quickly as you can. And like I said, everybody in the company should know it and be able to articulate it because you never know who you're talking to. Uh, we have a, a client for leadership and team building down in uh, Baltimore, and they are a company that does uh, wound care. If you have really dramatic wounds, they use uh, uh, the collagen from pig, and, uh, and, and they, they, they put human cells in it to grow new skin. So if you have a really devastating wound, they will lay that over it and uh, grow new skin. And they are not a startup. They are a $120 million company, probably. And, um, but they know that what happens in, the, uh, in that community, and, and they, they call it a medical device, 
up in the air on that, but in the medical device community and, and in pharma, what happens is you start the company and it's usually some scientists who, who have a great idea. They really don't have a whole lot of idea about business and how that works and what they need to do, uh, but still the, the, the power of the thing that they've invented and developed is the thing that pulls them into the market. And all they want to do is find somebody who is a larger organization to buy them. So we're going through a drill with them right now to make sure that everybody in that company understands what the elevator speech is and can articulate it. Wah, wah, wah. Your website and social media. I think Roseanne Barr knows the risks. <laughs> Now, you should be able to get as creative as the social media will allow you to do it while maintaining the messages that you want to have out there. Um, and if you can't, then maybe you shouldn't have a Twitter account. Um, and of course, you know, some people are going to select uh, you know, Facebook, some people are going to select Twitter, some people are going to take all of them, Instagram, uh, Pinterest whatever, um, you need to be able to agree to the immutable content. When I say immutable, I mean it doesn't change. It's always the same. So if you've got a group of people that are going to be tweeting and, 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 and putting content out there, you need to have a little meeting with them and you can say, you, you, should, you should agree to what you can always say. We can always say this. We can never say that. Or we can never say that in that way in order to make sure that everybody has the benefit of the creativity that's enabled with those platforms, but you're still able to maintain the message that you want. Hey, that's me. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Glad to take them. Glad to talk about your businesses and the challenges you face. Yeah. So when did you realize that you wanted to do what you ended up doing? Like, what was the aha moment? That's a great question. I, I remember the very moment uh, when I did that. I was in the military, and uh, I was uh, I was on shore duty. I was in the Navy. So if you're in the Navy, you're either floating around on a ship or you're on shore duty. Um, Four years on a ship, two years ashore. Um, so during that time that I was ashore, I actually extended for a year, and I had a three-year instructor program. And uh, during that time, I, I, I went to Stone College, um, and I took business administration as a course of study. And I was I was in a uh, finance class, and I had a really awesome instructor, uh, professor. And uh, you know, we, we had just uh, had a really great session and, discovering a lot of stuff, and, you know, he taught us how to read the Wall Street Journal and Barron's and all of this stuff, and, and I was driving home from that, and I said, this is what I want to do, I want to be in business. And uh, from that point forward, it was always something that I, that I thought that I should do, I didn't really know how to do it. When I first got out of the military, I went into sales, and uh, that's, that's something that'll get you closer to the, the, the upside and downside of business than, than sort of anything else in the business. If you're in operations, you don't deal with the same sets of, uh, sets of problems. Um, so I was successful at that. And uh, then you know, my friend, actually, a guy that I served with, was one of the two guys that I co-founded the, the first company with. And uh, he and I actually started a company that, that failed first. And uh, then we, we kept at it. And uh, that's, that's a really persistent, really important thing. You gotta keep at it. You're gonna get you're gonna get the headwind. You gotta keep at it. Um, failed in the first company, and then uh, when we when we thought about the second one, which became Premier, um, he was really he was really pushing. And me and this other guy were like, yeah, you know, we're doing okay now. We got this going on. We got that going on. You know. And he said, well, I'm doing it. If you're on board, you're on board. If you're not, then see ya. And so we said, oh. Better, better get on board with the time. <laughs> yeah, and it was the best decision we ever made. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun uh, coming up. It was a great deal of fun. 
Any other questions? Yes? Um, for version control, I had two questions. Okay. The first was, I'm one source of all of your promotional content. Does that mean the same thing as I'm one source for all your promotional content, or is that different because of the level? And the second question is, how one person control the content? I didn't understand that. Well, um, what you will find, in, and this is sort of a, a corporate take on that, um, but when you're, when in, in my line of work, uh, we always found that uh, version control was, was really critically important because you didn't want to have you know, nine different versions of, of some document that, that had to do, not, not a business plan, but a, a document that would be right for a copy. Um, you didn't want to have a lot of versions of that out there because it gives people different impressions of, of what the, the real thing is, and, and once it's out there, it's hard to pull it back. Um, so, so, so when when we were in the position of, of authoring that stuff, we would say to our clients, "We're controlling this," and everybody would have to, you know, around the table would have to nod and say, "Yes, you're controlling that." And so we were able to set up a system system where we said, "Okay, if you want it, I'll check it out to you," but any anything else that is not this is not going out. So don't take this and change it. Don't do don't do anything with it. We're trying to standardize the messages. And that requires it under very tight control. So any of your promotional content and a business plan would be, or anything else that has your messages out there, really has to be kind of controlled in that same way to make sure that there isn't all kinds of apparent stuff out there that, that doesn't maybe you pivot it. It doesn't any longer describe your brand, but describe the thing that you're doing. So you want to be able to make kind of control of that. So as a follow-up to the how do you properly contain your message or contain um, your pitch so that it isn't edited so that the people in your startup organization are all on the same page all the time. Mm -hmm. How do you contain the edit? Yeah, it depends, it depends on how sophisticated your system is. I mean, there are all kinds of systems out there for electronic document management, but that's not the business that you guys are in. Um, so, so again, it gets back to having one person who, who knows that the version of it dated June whatever, 19, or, uh, 2018, is, is the one that is the latest one. And you might have a system where you've got all the media and then you've got some, a tracking document that, uh, that shows which it is. Or you might have, you know, if you really want to get fancy, a list of affected pages in front of it that says, this version has this and all of these changes. Harder, harder to do. But I'm sure that if you if you if you Google the list of affected pages, you probably find a, a, an example of that and, and learn a little bit more about how it's used. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, so something just more specific uh, about pitching. Um, you said that you know obviously you don't want to have a dream come true, right? Because nobody's going to buy that, and you don't want to obviously highlight all of all of the risks and make it seem like something that you know. It's going to fail. Um, so, do you think there is a a good middle spot, or is it skewed yeah. towards more safe, or skewed towards more risky? Because I know people, they're going to be expecting a risk, and then people. Yes. So. You know, there's that there's a tension, right? Yeah. Uh, that, that you need to find that too good to be true versus you know, hey, I like this. It sounds ambitious and and optimistic, but I think it'll happen. So, you know, in your industry, you have to sort of figure that out. Um, mechanisms for doing that, uh, you know, part of that is is, is going to your first pitch and, uh, and and putting it out there and seeing how people react to it. Again, it's an agile function, right? Getting that feedback, or uh, talking to people who have no stake in what you're doing at all and doing a pitch for them and seeing what they think. Then they say, you know, uh, I think you're a little bit long on uh, on the optimism here, a little bit short on the truth. So let's uh, let's dial that back a little bit. So there are mechanisms to, to do it, but um, as with anything, uh, the, the the best thing you can do is try it. <laughs> yes. I think in addressing that, that the piece of advice you gave, where you come up with ways around or solutions to these possible risks uh, that may be faced, is a good way of mitigating perhaps the going too far or not going far enough. Let me understand that a little bit. Well, that, you, had, you had said at 
one point in um, dealing with risks that you don't want to overstate it, you don't want to understate it, right. but also that there is value in addressing some of those risks with possible solutions. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 And and uh, and that's the thing that, that I think you do want to do in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and when you do have, you know, you should have some sort of a, a SWOT analysis in there that says, here are the things that uh, that, that, that you know are, are problems for us. And yes, definitely put in the solution that you feel is going to be able to be used to, to mitigate the problem, the risk. So thank you. Any other questions? Going once. Yes, sir. So right now, it's very hard for us college students to do a lot of the work, which is why it's critical right now that in summer that we're working and stuff. Because mm -hmm. the moment school starts again, our production time is going to really slow down. And I noticed that. So how do startups or businesses or organizations handle that sudden rapid change in um, production time? Yeah. Um, well, if there isn't enough time in a 24-hour work day, you got to work nights. <laughs> eight days a week. Eight days a week. 35 no, days a week. You know, unfortunately, that's, that, that is something that you'll have to grapple with from the perspective of being an entrepreneur and, and, and feeling in your gut that you really want to pursue this. Um, if, if you don't, then the, you know, the startup phase is probably going to you know, blunt your enthusiasm to the point that you're going to get out of it anyway. And there's nothing wrong with getting out of it. Um, but if you really feel that your heart is in it, then you're going to put in the time. And unfortunately, but what year are you guys in? We're going to junior. Going to junior. I am too. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to my fifth year. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Overachieving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> PhD candidate, great. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, your school load is your school load. And uh, you know, obviously, for the, and I presume that you guys are in some sort of a either computer science or, or gaming or, or something like that. Yeah. And that's where Dr. Walter's Productions, Operations, and Management class will come in very handy if you get a chance to take the class. Because it helps you take a look at all those, you know, the work production and operations and kind of get work from them. Yeah, when we were first coming up in my first company, uh, first successful company, um, we were, you know, we would have clients come to us and they, they would say, hey, we need to have this developed, can you develop it? Sure. How much is that? Well, it's fifty thousand um, dollars. Okay. Uh, two weeks later, they would say, "Hey, we want to have you develop this as well. Can you do that?" I'd say, "Sure." <laughs> um, you know, how much is that? Fifty thousand uh, dollars. Okay. Another three weeks. Another another project. So so it was this situation where we were sort of double and triple billing ourselves and trying to figure out. You know, we were working 60, 70 hours a week, but. Again, these, this was in the 10-day cash turnaround time, so we were making, we were taking money out of the hand of the fist. It was awesome. Um, working hard, but playing hard, and we get paid. Anything else, folks? Thanks for coming. Thank and you. Great, Thank you. Um,